table. I guess it's because they're all washing the winder. It's nasty. Okay. Um, so I haven't had good luck, as you may have noticed, with the clickers and everything. So I'm just we give up on. So sorry. So I spoke to the other instructor. She's having exactly the same problems I am. It's just not working. Sorry. So, we, so you don't need to bring your clicker in anymore because it's not working. Okay, so um, what we were talking about and what I want to talk about briefly is this idea is of an infinite sequence, which is not the main point of this, of this section of the class, but it's a tool that we can use to understand infinite sums. Yeah. You're confusing me. Move back where you belong. Sorry. Okay, so we're talking about infinite sequences, which is just, this is a, an infinite list of numbers. And either this list converges or it doesn't. So it's something like 1, Minus a half, a third, plus minus a quarter. Uh, should have done that minus. Let's make this minus. Minus one, minus a third, quarter, minus a fifth, a sixth, etc. And in this case, if you wait long enough, this gets as close to zero as you like, and it stays there. So this converges to zero because, uh, well, okay, so that. So this converges to zero. Now one thing that you need to get used to doing, which is not hard in this case, is instead of writing it as a list like this, write a formula for the 17th term, or the 93rd term, or in general the nth term. So usually you would call this the, no, the first term, the second term, the third term, etc. And we need to figure out a formula here for the nth term. So what is the nth term? Good. So, you look at this, it's pretty obvious, or should be pretty obvious, that if I go to the tenth term, it will be a positive number, because it's, the bottom is even, and it will be positive one tenth. If I want to look at the hundred and third term, it will be minus one over hundred and three, and so on. And then showing that this goes to zero now comes down to showing that for n large, this number is as close to zero as you like. So saying that negative one e n over n, this means uh, that I can make negative one over n. Negative one to the n over n minus zero, small as I like, by taking n sufficiently big. Notice that this is not a function, so I can't really say f of x. is minus 1 to the x 
over x and claim that the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x is 0, because this doesn't mean anything. I have no idea what minus 1 to the x means when x is not a whole number. Well, OK, I guess I do kind of know what it means if x is a rational number, but I have no idea what minus 1 to the pi means. So this sort of doesn't make sense. Of course, we can just look at the absolute value and then notice that the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over x is 0. And since the absolute value goes to 0, this goes to 0. But this is sort of not a good argument. Because this doesn't make sense. So this is one subtlety about sequences versus functions, but it sort of behaves kind of like functions. Um, another similar kind of thing, suppose I want to look at, say I want instead of that, I want, well, I don't know, you can play with those in the homeworks. So let me, let me also point out, say I want to look at, sequence n, yeah, n to the n over n factorial. So this is a little harder to think about whether this converges or not. Does it? What do people think? Yes? No? So I hear some yes, and I hear a no. So we have those two choices. And I guess the third, I don't know, too hard for me to figure out. And that's another choice. So you say divergence, why? So let's make that a little more real. If you're right, let's make it a little more real. So if we look at, so A1 is 1 to the 1 over 1 factorial is 1. A2 is 2 squared over 2 factorial. A3 is 3 squared over 3 factorial which is, oops, 3 cubed over 3 factorial, which is 3 times 3 times 3 over 3 times 2 times 1. And a to the fourth is 4 times 4 times 4 times 4 over 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And um, so in general, a to the n is n over n times n over n minus 1 times n over n minus 2 oops, yes, on down to n over 1. And if we look at this, this is always bigger than n. Because this is 1, this is bigger than 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 1, and we have an n at the end. So this is certainly bigger than well, this equals 1. This is bigger than 1, so I can replace it by a 1 and make something smaller. This is bigger than 1, so I can replace it by 1 and make something smaller. The next term is bigger than 1, so I can replace it by 1 and make something smaller. 
And at the very end, I'm going to leave the n over 1 alone. So the nth term is always bigger than n. And we know that the sequence 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 diverges. Just add 1 every time. Right? It might look like it's going to converge, but in fact it doesn't. You have to analyze a little bit to see that it won't. You can't just say, gee, it seems like they're getting bigger. <clears throat> Similarly, to see whether something converges, you can't just say, gee, it seems like they're getting smaller. You need to work a little harder to show that it really is getting bigger or really is getting smaller. So I mentioned before that this comparison test that we looked at for integrals will come back. Here it's coming back in the context of sequences. I'm comparing a, a, a complicated sequence to a simple sequence. Every term in this simple sequence gets really big, or the terms get bigger and bigger and bigger, and this complicated sequence gets bigger faster. So I have a comparison here that Something that gets really big pushes up something complicated, so the complicated thing cannot converge. It's the same thing that we did when we looked at improper integrals and we compared them to more simple integrals. If the integral diverges and we have something bigger than it, then that diverges too. Same idea. Um, Okay, so a lot of times to attack these things, one way to do it is to group things intelligently and then make them smaller or make them bigger. Notice that if instead of doing n to the n over n factorial, I could apply a similar argument, which I won't do unless somebody really wants. I don't even know what I'm going to do. Okay, let's prove Sard's theorem. That's what I'm doing in my topology class. You want to do that? It only takes three classes, and it's just hard. But it's okay, I can do it. Um, okay, so similarly, you should be able to see, by the same argument, that this converges. Because if we just flip everything, then instead of making things smaller, we can make things bigger, and we can get a 1 over x. So we can see that this thing is smaller than, so I won't write out the details, but n factorial over n to the n is less than 1 over n. And 1 over n goes to 0, so n factorial over n to the n has to go to 0. It's kind of like another thing that may have confused you in calculus, the differential calculus was a squeeze theorem. The squeeze theorem is really a comparison theorem. It's the same kind of thing. Right here we have, just by a picture, 1 over n does this, and this sequence, well, they match up at 1, but then the next term, a2, is 2 over 2, 2 over 4, which is a half. Well, I guess they still match, right? Uh, A3 
is, wait a minute, what did they do wrong? Okay, yeah, 6 over, uh, 6, wait a minute, what the heck? Oh yeah, it's the other one. Yeah, 6 over 9, which is the third. They don't, why are they equal? What am I doing wrong here? That's not 9, it's 27. Okay, which is less than a third. And A4 is uh, 24 over whatever, uh, 64, which is certainly less than a quarter, and so forth. So this guy gets pushed down here, and so since this one goes down, that one's trapped. Something's wrong there. Uh, 4 times 3 times 2 is 24. 4 to the 4th is not 64. Well, I don't know. We're at 40. So, we can squish them in there. The best way to figure these things out is to play with quite a few of them, so of course I gave you a bunch of homework, yay. All right. Another So, as I mentioned at the end of the last class, we can also define these sequences recursively. This comes up a lot in certain courses of study, like computer science, but also in other things. So this notion of a recursive, recursive definition, would be something like, um, I tell you, well, so one really well-known one is, say, the Fibonacci sequence. This one doesn't converge, but it's well-known. So, how many people know what the Fibonacci sequence is? A couple. How many people don't know what the Fibonacci sequence is? Okay. So, the Fibonacci sequence, we take the first term to be 1, the second term to be 1, and then from here on, we just add the last two together to get the previous one. So, A3 is 1 plus 1, A, which is 2, A4 is 2 plus 1, maybe my numbers are off, sometimes people start with 0 and so on. So A5, A5 is now this plus this. And in general, AN is AN minus 1 plus AN minus 2. The Fibonacci came up with this as a way to, in his thought experiment where he came up with this sequence, he was describing rabbits. So you have a pair of rabbits, they're too young to breed, so they don't breed. The next, I don't know how long it takes rabbits to grow up, the next month, you still have a pair of rabbits. But then the next month, they breed, and now you have two pairs of rabbits. And then the next month, these two pairs breed, and you have three pairs. And then the next month, the three pairs breed, and so on. So you get this sequence, and this grows really fast. It doesn't look like it yet. But this goes really fast. So, for example, a6 is, is 5 plus 3 is 8. a7 is 8 plus 5 is 13. And you start to see this grows exponentially fast. Okay. So, the idea of recursive is that we define a n in terms of previous A again. So so it's possible to write a formula for what the 15th term of the Fibonacci sequence is. I won't do it. It has to do with the golden mean. Uh, but anyway, so it, it has to do with square roots and stuff. 1 plus root 5 over 2. Um, 
but sometimes it's not. But this gives us another way to define sequences. Now, I'm going to put aside the notion of sequences. Um, I'll give you, you know, your, your, your paper, next paper homework will involve some, some of this kind of stuff. But I want to talk about something else, which is a special kind of sequence, which unfortunately goes by the name of series. And because in English the word sequence and series means pretty much the same thing, it gets confusing. So I'm going to try not to use the word series. Instead, I'm going to use the word sum, which does not mean the same thing as sequence. So I'm going to talk about infinite sums now. I'll put series here in parentheses. Because in the book they're going to be referred to as series, and you'll often see them encounter the series. But I will always try to say sums. These are special sequences. So this is a special sequence. Sometimes. Um, where the sequence of numbers that I get, I get by adding stuff to what I already have. So, for example, um, let's take, and I'm going to use S now to indicate that it's a sum. So I'm going to make the sequence S1, S2, S3, etc. So instead of calling it A, I'm going to call it S to emphasize it's a sum. And let's take S1 equal to 1, and then S2. To that, I'm going to add one half square, and then S3. I'll take whatever I had before, so it's sort of a recursive thing, plus one third square, and then S4. So this is one plus one half square plus one third squared. Actually, this isn't what I wanted to do. Let me do one that I can actually add up. I can add this one too, but let's not do it now. Well, okay, so let's just do this one for an example and then we'll come back. And in general, Sn will be the previous guy plus one over n squared. So I just keep adding a little bit each time, which in this case, 1 plus a half square plus a third square plus a quarter square plus 1 over n squared, and then I stop. And as I said, as we've seen before, we have a nicer notation for this. This gets a little tedious to write out. So we have another notation that we can use that scared some people at the start of the class. Um, so I'm going to start at n equals, let's use instead of n, let's use i. i equals 1, and then I'm stopping at n of 1 over i squared. So this sigma notation just means add these things. And I tell you where to start and where to stop. So these two notations are exactly the same thing. I used it at the beginning of the class. Several people were confused. Several people had no problem with it. But we're going to use it quite a lot from now on. So if it bothers you, you need to get used to it. So this sigma is a Greek letter, capital letter S. It's supposed to make you think of the word sum. So it's supposed to make you think of adding things. Okay, is everybody clear on this notation? And for those of you that dropped down from 127, hey, it's like the first day again. Um, okay, so I'm not going to say whether this makes any sense. Well, this makes sense. But what we don't yet know is how to make sense of whether 
this is a number or not as n gets large. As n goes to infinity, does this have a limit or not? And that's one of the central points of what we're going to do for the next while in this class. So in general, so the name for this Sn is sometimes called the sequence of partial sums. In other words, I add up to n terms and then I stop and I see what I got. And the question is, if I do this and I stop it in terms, uh, well, instead of writing 1 over i squared, let's just write a sub i. Does this limit, as I let it go to infinity, so this is the same thing as the limit as n goes to infinity of Sn, does this converge? And either it will or it won't. Or you can't say because it's just too hard. It either does converge or it doesn't, but sometimes it's hard to know. Now in this example, I'm using 1 over i squared. I don't want to quite do that one yet. Let's start with easier ones. But this is sort of one of the central questions that we'll look at for a while. Given a setup like this, does this converge? Now remember what I said last time, our real goal is not to do this just for lists of numbers, but to do this for lists of functions. We want to add a we want to make infinite degree polynomials and see if they make sense. We want to add up things here where there's an x involved. But we'll get there. We're just not ready to get there yet. And that will give us a new kind of function that we can get. Okay, so is this, is this where we're going make sense? Yeah? Okay, so, um, so let's work on some examples and see this is why we need to introduce at least a little bit about sequences because often until we build up some tools in order to show that a series converges or a sum converges we turn it into a sequence and look at the sequence. So let's start with something relatively easy that you've probably all seen before. You probably saw it you might have seen it in middle school. I think it's in the middle school curriculum. Suppose instead of letting my numbers grow, I let the powers grow and I fix the number. So I want to look at so I want to look at this where I say take a half and raise it to the nth power. So I want to know, does this make sense? So this means I'm looking at the scene, and let's start it at zero instead of one. So one of the things that you have to pay attention to is all of these symbols here mean something. We're starting here at zero, so we have a zero term instead of a, one term, a first term. We go to infinity, and then we have some jump here, and that big sigma means add. So this means we want to look at <coughs> the sequence, the first partial sum is 1 half to the 0 is 1. Our second partial sum, I guess I'll go down, is 1 plus, and now we let n be 1, 1 plus 1 half. Our next term in the series is S3, which is 1 plus a half plus a half squared, which is 1 plus a half plus a quarter, which is something, I don't know, I'm going to write them down. 
and so on. And in general, Sn is 1 plus a half plus a half squared, half cubed, blah, 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 blah. And then we stop at 1 over 2 to the n. Now this has a chance of converging because I start with something, I add something smaller to it. And to that I add something half that size. And to that I add something half that size. So I start with something one unit tall. Let's make it one unit tall. There we go. Actually, this is area one. So let me give you a geometric proof that this works. I'll prove it analytically in a sec. I start with something of area one. And now I want to put, I want to add something of area one half. So let's make it one unit wide, but only half as tall. So this has area a half. And now I want to add in something of area <coughs> one quarter. So instead of being that, let's make it that piece. Right? I'm, I'm going to be half a unit tall by half a unit wide. And now the next term is 1 eighth. To get something of area 1 eighth, well, let's take half of a quarter and that's a 16. What did I do wrong here? 1 and 8. Uh, it's, uh, no, that's a quarter of a quarter. Well, okay, somehow I'm screwing this up. Anyway, I can, I can just add in these little bits here, and they should add up to 2 by just continuing this pattern, and I see that it fits into 2. So that's sort of a, an idea that this should add up to 2. But let's make it a little more precise. How many of you have seen this before? How many of you have not seen this before? You're lying. This is a geometric series. How many of you have never seen a geometric series before? See? There's less people. So some of you are liars. You're not liars, you're just three people. But it's okay. Okay, so how can we do something? <coughs> now obviously, I'm using a two here, but any number will work. Wait, I just put that up. Try this one. Now well, how can we see what this adds up to without drawing little pictures like that? So if I look at that list, 1 plus a half plus blah, 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 if I look at Sn, it's a list. What, what do I get if I take half of it? So Sn is 1 plus a half plus a half squared plus etc. up to 1 over 2 to the n. Suppose I took half of this n. What do I get? Well, I'm going to start over here. I get a half plus, right, one, one half times 1 is a half. One half times a half Maybe I, should I write? Is this, people understand where these terms are coming from? Anybody confused? You're confused? Or, yeah, um, wouldn't you just find the value of the sum of Sn and then multiply that number by one half? I don't know what the sum of Sn is. Well, I mean, I do, but if I haven't figured it out, I don't know what it is. Right? So, if n is 1 million, and you don't know the formula for a partial sum of a geometric series, how are you going to figure it out? You're not just going to punch it into your calculator. 
How are you going to figure it out? You can't. So I have to be clever and figure out a formula for SM. So the way I'm going to figure out a formula for SM, let me do it in two steps, is by being clever and noticing that if I take a half of that, it gives me the same thing, just shift it over by one. Because a half of one is a half. A half of a half is 1 over 2 squared. A half of 1 over 2 squared cubed, I mean a half of 1 over 2 squared is 1 over 2 cubed. So a half of each term that I get here just gives me the next term. So I'll pick up this one from the 2 to the n minus 1, and then I have a half of this. And now I can be clever and subtract. Um, so if I subtract, which way do I want to subtract? It doesn't really matter, but let's subtract this. Let's do this minus this. So if I subtract here, well, Sn is some number. And Sn minus a half of an Sn is still a half of an Sn. But here, when I subtract, lots of stuff cancels. 1 minus 0 is 1. Half minus half is 0. Then 0. 0. Good, 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 good. Minus, let me just write it here, 1 over 2 to the n plus 1. So that means that Sn is twice this. Well, now I figured out what Sn is. I have a formula that tells me. So I have now a turn to this sum, which is nasty, I have to add a lot of things, into a sequence. I know that if I add up the first 53 terms, I will get 2 times 1 minus 1 over 2 to the 53, which is very close to 2. And if I add up the first million terms, I get 2 times 1 minus 1 over 2 to the million and 1. So I know now that So I know now that this i equals uh, to the n, oh, sorry, i equals 1 to n of 1 over 2 to the i is 2 times 1 minus 1 over 2 to the i plus 1. If I add up n terms, oops, not i, n. If I add up n terms, I get this. So now I can take a limit. Because I've turned it into a sequence. And as n goes to infinity, this goes to zero, and the whole thing adds up to two just like in my pictures. And there was nothing magic about 2 here. And so let's do it again quickly for, instead of 2, for just the conventional letter is R. If I do the same game with R, so I'm not going to write out all of the steps, I'm just going to point. So if I have n equals 0 to infinity, not 1 over R, let's just call it R, of R to the n, R is a number between minus 1 and 1, so it's a fraction. Then I can play the same game. 
I guess I'll write a couple of terms. 1 plus r, r squared, blah, 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 r to the n. If I multiply it by r, I get r, r squared, blah, 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 r to the n, r to the n plus 1. Then I can subtract. Stuff cancels. Cancel, cancel, cancel. And then I can divide. And now, so this works for any R. But if R is less than 1, in absolute value, this will go to 0 when I take the limit. So I get 1 over 1 minus R. OK, I didn't. I multiplied by R, and then I subtracted. So I subtracted so that I can kill this, kill this, kill this, kill, 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 kill and be left with just two numbers instead of a huge list. Okay, so the goal was to get rid of this junk. And I had to be a little clever, or know how to do it. I guess it's sort of the same thing. To figure out how to do it. But that's what I did. So what I've just shown is that. Well, two things. If you want to add up a bunch of powers, whether it's less than 1 or not, the sum of a bunch of powers is that. So if I want to add up 1, so I want to add up 1 plus 2 squared plus 2 cubed plus 2 to the third plus 2 to the fourth plus up to 2 to the hundredth, the answer will be 2 to the hundred and first plus 1. Uh, Divided by uh, 1 minus. Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes, this is a minus. This is a minus. Yes. Typo. Because I subtracted, so when I subtract, this is minus. Thank you. Yeah. So when I did the example of 2, I was wondering why it wasn't working. Good. Okay, so anyway, so we've, but we've also shown that if we add up a bunch of powers infinitely a lot, not the number r, this is 1 over 1 minus r if r is not too big in absolute value. Now, realize, of course, this tells you something else. So this tells us that if I want to add up the powers of a third, that I get 1 over 1 minus a third, that is 3 halves. But really, this is also a function. So I want to emphasize that this is telling us more. So this is called a geometric series. Unfortunately, nobody calls it a geometric sum, but it's a geometric series. And it's because it arose in a geometric situation where you're chopping something like this. But notice that in, in addition to this, something, if I look at this same formula a different way, I mean, it doesn't matter what letter I use, if I use R or X or a banana, it's still true. So I've just shown that 1 over 1 minus x is 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed plus x to the fourth plus blah 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 forever. So this has sort of given us a different way to do division in some sense. We can do division 
by adding and multiplying. As long as the number is small. And we'll come back to this. But here we have sort of an infinite degree polynomial. And this infinite degree polynomial is this rational function. Because it doesn't matter whether I use r or x. Okay. So there's one example of an infinite sum. And even though it seems weird to be adding up infinitely many things, it makes some amount of, it makes sense, you can make sense of it, as long as those things shrink fast enough. But it is not sufficient for those things to just shrink to zero. If they shrink to zero too slowly, so, then they won't add up. I mean, they will add up. They'll add up to too much stuff. So, let's look at another version of this kind of thing. Notice that the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over x is certainly 0. Well, no, it isn't. It's certainly 1 over x. 1 over n is certainly 0. That is the sequence 1, 1 half, 1 third, 1 quarter, 1 fifth, blah, 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 goes to 0. What about, and here I can't start at 0, so let's start at 1. If I add up the terms, so this is 1 plus a half plus a third plus a quarter, like that. It seems like this should converge, but it doesn't. So this does not converge. This is called the harmonic series. I don't care if you know this name, but if you hear the name, then you know it. And this does not converge, and let me show you why it doesn't converge. It seems like it should. And in fact, if you get out your computer and you start calculating, it will seem to converge. But that's because your computer has finite precision. It converges, it, it diverges incredibly slowly. So it, I can get this as big as I like, but it takes a really long time to get bigger than 10, say. So let's, let's go through that. So let's just start looking at the partial sums and see what we can do. So S1 Let me just write out Sn for n large. So let's just write at 1 plus a half plus a third plus a quarter plus a fifth plus a sixth plus a seventh plus an eighth. Maybe that's enough. Maybe I'll need to add some more. And now what I want to do is I want to start grouping things. Um, and I always forget where I want to group them. Uh, I guess I can group them wherever I want. No, that doesn't help. So I want to compare this to, I want to group them into things that are bigger than a half. So I'll just start with the one, and I'll leave it alone. And a half is just fine. Maybe I want bigger than one. Let's go bigger than one. So, why am I not seeing this? My brain is crazy. Well, okay. So a half is fine here, but notice that one third 
is bigger than a quarter. So this is bigger than, I leave the one alone, let's leave the half alone. A third is bigger than a quarter. So if I replace the third with a quarter, no problem. And I'll leave the quarter alone. And now a fifth is bigger than an eighth. And so is a sixth, and so is a seventh. So I'm going to sort of replace these guys with quarters, and I'm going to replace these guys with eighths. And then a ninth, a tenth, an eleventh, a twelfth. I don't want to go all the way to sixteen. I'm going to replace the next set with sixteenths. And in general, I'm going to replace these with powers of two that add up to a half, right? A ninth through a sixteenth, each of those terms is less than a sixteenth. Now, why did this do me any good? Well, now let's add one plus a half. And then if I add these two together, I get another half. And then if I add these four eighths together, I get another half. And then if I add these eight sixteens together, I get another half. And then if I add the 16 30 seconds together, I get another half. And then if I add the following 32 60 fourths together, I get another half. So this is bigger than 1 plus as many halves as you want. So this goes to infinity. I shaved off things and made them smaller. And I wound up with something that gets as big as I like. It takes a long time to get there, but it gets as big as I like. So again, I use this comparison test to show that the harmonic series is bigger than, than the series of just adding a lot of halves together. I just have to wait a while to add together those halves. So I will pick up with this kind of thing on Friday. Yeah, I guess I'm proud of it.